Hello and good morning to everyone. Allow me to please and foremost apologize for the late start. And welcome. Welcome to members of the media who are joining us here today and everybody who will scatter. As LGBTQ groups gathered in North America this week for a capacity building workshop hosted by EK, the Dominican High Court delivered its decision in the case challenging the validity of sections 14 and 16 of the Sexual Offenses Act, declaring these provisions which criminalize same sex intimacy in the Commonwealth of Dominica unconstitutional. The case was supported by Minority Rights Dominica, Miriam, and the HIV Legal Network as the EK workshop has just ended. The two Caribbean networks wish to engage the local media on the recent court, court decision. I am Antonio Moyes, the CLO or CBC in Dominica, and I will be your MC this morning. Um, next to me is Ms. Anita Placid, Executive Director of Eastern Caribbean Alliance for Diversity and Equality UK, and she will be the first one sharing the statement this week. Hello, good morning, everybody, and again, thank you um, for the opportunity to speak on the matter. I think as we look at the need for the region, we see really and truly um, our main reason for being in Dominica was to really bring civil society organizations together to increase the capacity to continue advocating um, for the rights of the minority of LGBT persons. Um, with that, um, you know, we were able to bring in the victory along with our colleagues here in Dominica. This is a victory, it's a small victory, and there's much work to be done. Um, when we think about um, the Commonwealth of Dominica being the first republic among the OCS, we can well appreciate how the Dominica is one of those leading the charge in ensuring that the rights of the citizens is observed and upheld. And this victory is to that nature in saying that we are open to that discussion and we are recognizing that. The Eastern Caribbean Alliance for Diversity and Equality here do not um, just work with civil society, we work among the degree we work with um, police because we do believe access to justice. Um, access to health services, um, access as a citizen is something everyone has the right to. However, we recognize where um, persons who identify as part of the LGBT community or have an expression that is different from others face, you know, discrimination in a way that I think our society has not generally acknowledged that it's happening. Violations are happening on a daily basis. Now, this law that has been considered unconstitutional is just recognizing that actually within the law itself, it was discriminatory because it only really pressed upon one set of people. And that is important for people to understand that it's not saying that uh, the whole country is going to be gay. If the whole country is not just going to have homosexuals because this problem is removed. But what it removes is that criminal sanction that actually creates an atmosphere of hostility. Because people think that they can violate others' rights who identify as LGBT because there's a law they believe that they are protected. Now, we are not about to climb the moral campus, and I do think we have the, the authority to speak on church and what that impact is. But we also know where some of that stigma and discrimination runs from, particularly because others see themselves as godly and see LGBT as being the population. And I'm saying this because I'm actually calling the elephant in the room, which is where a lot of people are going to take this conversation about where we are. But I do think that we need to recognize as a people, when the High Court declared 14 and 16 of the Sexual Offenses Act unconstitutional, it simply said, let's not use the law as a crutch to continue violating others. 
would you want to identify as your or whose expression this in terms of that of yours? The reading of this spot aligns with other readings that we have seen in the region and worldwide. But I'm not going to focus on the worldwide and I'm not going to focus on the region because the focus really is what is this going to do for the maker and with the maker. And I think it is understanding that if we can all agree that when stigma and discrimination hurts, it doesn't just hurt one person, it hurts a family, it doesn't hurt a community. And that means by extension, the society needs to be. Our next statement will be coming from Joel Simpson. Spokesperson of Caribbean Forum for Liberation and Acceptance of Genders and Sexualities, Caribbeans. <laughs> Media four colleagues from EK, Caribbeans, uh, Monty Wall, and um, Joel Simpson from Guyana speaking this morning on behalf of the Caribbean Forum for Liberation and Acceptance of Genders and Sexuality Caribbeans. We are a pan-Caribbean LGBTIQ network that is working with groups and organizations from the north to the south to west and east of the region and includes groups and countries which are English, Spanish, French, and Dutch speaking. So really pan Caribbean in nature. On behalf of the regional network, I first want to congratulate the Commonwealth of Dominica for joining a growing majority of CARICOM countries that have now eliminated these outdated colonial era laws, which criminalize intimacy between consenting adults. We think this ruling is a major step towards ensuring respect and dignity for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. And it adds more momentum to the growing trend across the Caribbean of modernizing our laws oh, to ensure our gay and lesbian neighbors Basically. are afforded the same respect as everyone else in our societies. Dominica is a very good company and only needs to look at its neighboring countries like Barbados, Antigua, and Barbuda, St. Kitts, Trinidad and Tobago, Belize, to understand that what the impact of this ruling this week will be. LGBT people in Dominica will now be more safe and protected. But for most people in society, nothing else will really change. This ruling in Dominica like similar rulings across the Caribbean, is about ending criminalization of gay people under state law. Nothing in this week's ruling, like I need to say, will force any religious organization or group to change their beliefs or do anything that they don't want to do. And we'll hear from colleagues um, in the Caribbean, in the Eastern Caribbean, who, de who decriminalized and disappears about what has happened in their country since similar rulings and since these laws have been overturned by their courts. The Dominica Constitution protects freedom of religion just as strong and just as securely as it did last week. So this week's ruling did not change that. But the ruling, however, eliminates the state from being a leading contributor to bullying and acts of discrimination in everyday life in Dominica. Like our colleagues from Miriam said at their press conference on Monday, which I was fortunate to be able to attend, the, the loops that seem to be over the necks of LGBTQ Dominicans has now been removed. So people can breathe a little more comfortably, they can feel a little bit more safer. And that's important, that the state is not perpetrating this discrimination in and of itself through the laws. 
most people in Dominica would not want the authorities monitoring what they do in the privacy of their bedroom. And I've been listening to the social media commentary from Dominicans here this week, and listening a bit to the radio stations, and that's a common sentiment. Um, and I think at least there's majority um, opinion around that, that everybody deserves the same privacy. Because like the judge said in the case as well, there are other acts that people might consider tomorrow, adultery, fornication, and those acts are not criminalized. So why just criminalize one particular form of intimacy and target one set of adults who are consenting and doing this in the privacy of their homes? And that's when this week's ruling by the Dominican High Court ensures that the same privacy and respect afforded to every Dominican, every citizen of this beautiful island, it, that it also includes gay and transgender people in Dominica. Thank you. Any questions? Next, we will be taking country statements, starting with Ms. Carmen Innes, Director for meeting emotional and social needs holistically as mesh in the Antigua and Barbuda. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator, members of the press, colleagues, um, this is a, another win for the career. On behalf of mesh and uh, our one voice group in Antigua and Barbuda. I wish to say thanks or in fact congratulations to the people of Dominica in terms of this win. This is another win that signifies that there is an understanding that we are all one people with the same equal rights and must be treated with the same dignity and respect like others. My colleague from Guyana has placed that into very great context for us also. It also serves as a safety network for the security and safety of persons who within the Dominican However, this is not the time for us to celebrate. It is a time for us to continue our work in terms of the educating of our society on topics of human rights for all, and that we must love and pay for each other the way in which we want persons to love and pay for us. We must pay a special thanks to EK for championing the cause and keeping the wheel of justice turning for Keep the village of this and say thanks also to our funding agencies for supporting and ensuring that our field activities are fruitful. Thanks also to the supporters of Dominic who lend a hand or listening ear to our colleagues while they were in the field. As a society and a country as a whole, we cannot join hand using one voice as we continue to advocate for the safety and protection of our LGBT people within our country. We who are brothers, sisters, friends, family, and the contributing persons of society. And most important, that we, what to say in this context, we are children of the same God that we serve. Congrats also for the legal team for a job well done. Our work has just begun. It's no time for celebration, but we have to ensure now that we continue your back into the communities and start re-educating and also educating 
course, of the human society about human rights. And we must also treat each other the same way in which we want others to treat us. Again, to our colleagues from Dominica, we say congratulations. Thank you. And next, we'll be hearing from Dr. Nastasi Amaran, Vice President, Vice President of Equals Barbados. Thank you, Antonio. Good morning, everyone. So our statement is short and succinct, but I think gets directly to the heart of the matter. It's been almost two years since Barbados has had a similar ruling. While LGBTQ plus Barbadians still face numerous barriers of discrimination that prevent us from being full and equal citizens, the ruling has at least removed the criminalization of our lives. It's a welcome step of progress, and while it has meant so much for LGBTQ plus Barbadians, as expected, it has had no negative on other Barbadians. Thank you. Okay, now that everybody has given their statements, I'm going to open the floor to any questions that you want to answer. So, um, I heard you mention that it's not really time for celebration, and that we need to go back to the communities, re educate. What are the next steps will Dominica take um, in regards to this ruling? I think in all fairness, the main organization, Mirdom, who has been doing the education on the ground, I mean, definitely that will continue. Um, and although we all sit in different organizations in different countries, it's uh, it's not really us to determine what's next for Dominica, but we certainly, in our capacity, um, as EK, um, who is Secretary at Insinusha, Califlans, um, what there is is a network, and we'll continue supporting each other mm -hmm. and, and, and trying to make sure that. I mean, one of the things we try to do also is to try to make sure that the work is happening across all countries. So I can see what the bigger picture is, and our bigger picture is getting to a point where LGBT persons are not used as the, the negotiation pairs. We are not used as the topic of morality to fill the church. We are not used. So how are we seen as citizens with talent who contributes to the economy, who's part of development? Um, and that's the bigger picture. How can we put to the very same services that everybody, without necessarily having the label, but just having the label of speaking of anything? And as you know it, by extension, the name six has been um, the freedom of movement. How do we go through any of our countries and be able to get the same services without that label that people seem to use as that sort of? I will add just very briefly to what Kanita said. Um, well, as you know, Miriam had their press conference on Monday, and they said very clearly that they will be working on the education as well. And uh, EK, we're here thanks to EK, uh, the OECS sub-regional network, uh, Eastern Caribbean, I should say, sub-regional network. And one of the reasons I was asked to come here was to share a little bit about how we are doing public education in Guyana. And now that they have this positive ruling, uh, my colleagues from Dunn have asked to stay in touch and to share with them in a lot more detail about how they can do similar public education initiatives in Dominica to get people to understand that we need to stop the violence, we need to stop the discrimination, we need to treat people with dignity and respect. We need to recognize that all of us have the right to privacy. You might not agree with what I'm doing in my bedroom, even now with this victory, but you need to respect that I have the right, as long as I'm cons consenting adults are participating, as long as it's happening in private, 
I have the right to sue you because I don't dictate what you should do your bedroom, right? So I should be allowed the same space and freedom in Dominica. So the focus is really on public education. And I can say that uh, having heard on this press conference and the engagement over the last couple of days in the PK workshop with our colleagues from, from, from Mary Dom and the Dominican Quality Association. Any other questions? Um, <clears throat> the region, are there any court cases currently ongoing or is it going to be spread? So that's the thing. Um, I think, okay, as it is, probably one cases you asked, right? Um, so at this very moment, we still have cases of the same um, and these are different cities. Um, I mean, even for the region itself, we're still awaiting a decision on the appeal from trade and into the world. Um, there's an appeal happening in St. Vincent as well. Um, we have one in Jamaica. Um, I think we are also appealing in this case. And we also have a case that will soon be filed. You know, so I think that there is a lot of movement in the region. The interesting thing is the movements we are seeing are not just on the sexual offenses in relation to LGBT persons. We are also seeing those, those movements within the courts also on that of just the amendments of our sexual offenses, including rape, um, including harassment. We are seeing those um, conversations coming up in relation to abortion as well. And HIV on infections and the criminality. So, again, I think what we are seeing is really um, um, all our divisions, our, our justice in terms of we need to be able to amend those laws, add new laws, subtract laws, where it's actually serving the people um, and not just sitting there and making it. And for us at Carol Blatt, the takeaway really is with all this litigation, all of this movement, that the trend is positive across the region. The Bahamas, since the many years ago, since the last century, the early 90s, if I remember correctly, they removed these laws to Parliament. They didn't have to go through litigation. And now, at the current state of play, for five other countries in CARICOM, Belize, Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, Antigua and Barbuda, and St. Kitts. So when you add that up, the majority of CARICOM countries that have had these laws have now removed them. So it's a positive trajectory, and it's a lesson for all the other countries that have not as yet, <laughs> including my one country I have. So we have the culture of all of the and in the United States expectations that are in that the culture is going to be What are some of the needs or some of the measurable needs are you taking to kind of break down that stigma and reach out to the public when I'm listening? Or this campaign is listening? Yes. I think this comes to me, and I think. Each of the countries we think about being their share, this is some of the campaigns that the city is. Um, this is more than, I mean, let's just be clear. The manner in which we have been socialized also requires us to be educated within our own community as well. Even within the LGBT community, we have to consistently do that education. And then we have been socialized in the general society. And so we also have to unlearn you know, certain ways to also relearn the proper way of doing things. Um, but with that said, what we look at is the impact. So I think Miridon and all of our organizations have been engaged in different layers and levels of sensitization, education. Um, and this is working with different state actors and stakeholders because this is not just the LGBT community. This is about how it's going to affect the entire society. 
So whether it be nurses, doctors, lawyers, going to schools, and where there is simply doing education around bullying and being fallen. Sometimes this is where it starts to kind of rolling back and pushing back about this behavior being normal. Because I think when LGBT talk about being bullied, you know, oh, this is a normal thing, we all went through it. No, it's not. It's not a normal thing, but it is what has become socially accepted. And it doesn't make it right because there are different degrees of it. Um, and one of the examples I like to use is that a few years ago, there was a little bit of name calling. Um, and which is fine. Then it came to a little bit of stones throwing and people accepted it. But now people are being stabbed and killed. At what point do our acceptance of violations stop? And for persons in different countries who have had to bury friends, it tells us that we cannot just sit silently on the side of the continue. And for most things, they say those who feel it knows it. And the feeling has not been great when someone has been killed on their on the assumption of their sexual orientation. Which is something a lot of people who actually do believe in church, they understand what persons of religious belief went through before should not be the ones actually hyping it to happen in the country. Because the, the will of our religious leaders, whether they take responsibility for it or not, has major impact on our society. And that responsibility has not been made at the beginning. But the campaigns that they're looking at doing and have been doing is simply normalizing LGBT persons. Because when people, and this is something, when people get to know someone is part of the LGBT community, it's almost like they start to demonize them. It's like all of a sudden you're not human. All of a sudden you're not part of a family. The mother who gave birth to you all of a sudden seeing you as an estranged person. The family who loved you that you did everything for pushes you aside and society continues to do this. But this is the same person you love and give birth to. This is your brother, your sister, your cousin, your father, your mother. It has not changed the person that stands before you. And so this is something that we have to bring home because we don't break families, we actually cut up that. And so I actually like you know my colleagues to just share with us around the campaigns they have been doing to bridge that gap. Because this is where it has to happen. At the, and, and the media house is also our part to play it in terms of how we sensationalize things, how we bring things out. We do two things we educate or we simply wait for the Thank you. Okay, in Antigua and the Barbuda, our campaign did not have uh, its targets. Persons and the LGBT people's community, but it did not stop there. During the campaign, we um, we we contacted family members, friends, and business people, professionals also, who we uh, discussed the whole issue of the law. They are aware of it also, and they are friends and supporters of the LGBT people's community. So what they did, the main group, they actually formed themselves into a group and called themselves One Box. Because we are speaking the same platform. We are all talking about the decriminalization of the sexual offenses, the end of the sexual offenses act from Antigua and Barbara. Um, it was very easy for us in terms of us as members, instead of us going out and talking to every person, the certain section of the society that we did not have access to, okay, they have access to, and they went out there and they uh, um, shared messages as to it relates in front of the reason why we should support the decriminalization of the Sexual Offenses Act and it is not beneficial to persons from the LGBT plus community, but to the society as a whole. And um, after our ruling, we have realized that more and more persons, all walks of life, including the churches, 
all are coming for the last sinus of O and beta. If you don't again, you find that first the last sinus to go into the uh, to the space and talk about human rights and the and, and other issues that related to the whole issue and from the LGBT LGBT to um persons. Um we still have more work to do. We are aware of that. And we are in for the long haul. And that's why I said earlier that B, it is not time for celebration, because we have to go out there and educate and re-educate persons, taking it one day at a time, or one person at a time. So I think this is a great question because cultural change often takes such a long time and it's a long process. But and peoples has been part of various campaigns that seek to um unite <laughs> LGBT people as people and show that we are little just like everybody else. Uh, but I wanted to spotlight that we do uh, diversity trainings, sensitization sessions with both the public, public and private sector. And that has been extremely successful with the groups we've been able to engage, but we can definitely um, enlarge that. So that's something we're working on. And we've also been part of Pride, which has increased the visibility of the community um, to great effect and has been successful in Barbados for several years now. Any more questions? Well, if there are no more questions, thank you so much for coming to members of the media, everybody who joined us online, and our colleagues here in this room. We appreciate you taking the time out of your way to come and speak with us. And again, just thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.